In the last scene, it seemed like the entire thing was vibrating like crazy, but uh, that actually was due to the fact that I had the camera mounted on the same table as the lathe, and this lathe runs rougher than a cob, and that's uh, what you were seeing. Now, uh, look back here, and this is where the indicator is butted up against the carriage, and I've already, uh, I'm on 20 thousandths right now, approximately, I think it's 24, for my first pass. So move this back. I'm still not done with the first pass, and I'm going to go up to the layout line. You can have a, a piece of tape on there, or bluing, or a mark, whatever you want. And once I get to that mark on this first pass, I am going to uh, zero out this collar and make a note of that in my head and then I'm going to uh, come to that measurement each time so that I don't uh, come in real hard to the end of the keyway and break the cutter off. It's very easy to break a little cutter like this. So let's complete this pass. I'm not going to show all the passes, but let's complete this pass. The z-axis is locked. The same as you would lock uh, your milling machine in every direction except the one that you're feeding it. There's a lot of sensitivity on this machine. I can feel it cutting more than you can feel the cut on a massive bridge board machine. There is a little oil on the work. the black line we're just about there my burr is rolling over it it's kind of hard to see and I'm setting my collar to zero now I'll back this off and for my next pass now I'm going to unlock the carriage and come in about another twenty thousandths. Lock it again. I'm going to put some oil on the, the work and take several more passes off camera. Alright, this is our last pass. We're down to the correct depth. And I'm feeding in here, up to the black line and then to my zero mark on that collar, and then we're done. There's going to be quite a big burr on here. Don't break that cutter off. Wear your safety glasses at all times in the shop. Mine are on. Revolution on the cross feed here, which is our Y axis. There we are. I'm going to back it off, turn off the machine, and let's have a look at that. There we are. Let's. Uh, I'm going to deburr it, and we'll take another look at it. Three sixteenths keyway, three quarter inch stock. There's the finished work with a key in the keyway, and You know, I think that uh, did as good a job as what my uh, bridge board does. It took uh, longer, however, because I had to take lighter cuts, but still a satisfactory uh, way of, of uh, putting keyways in shafts. Let's talk about alternate ways of measuring on this axis. 
which is the x-axis. Uh, I've been using this magnetic base indicator and you can see it moving as I move the carriage back and forth. But if you don't have one of those, you can use a traditional magnetic base indicator and I've got that mounted uh, right down here on the lathe table which happens to be made of steel. Now if you don't have that uh, luxury uh, and you don't have any place to, to mount an indi indicator uh, and now watch this little indicator. That works real nice too as I move the carriage. Now you can also use your carriage stop and I'll show you that now. Now another way of uh, measuring your longitudinal movement along the x-axis is to use your carriage stop if you have one and you can bring the carriage right up to that and that could be your zero mark and then if you wanted to move the carriage exactly ten thousandths this way simply back the stop off ten thousandths or whatever your reading would be you can lock that you need to and then move your carriage up against it and then in turn lock your carriage on the other end. The carriage stop can of course be moved any place on the bed with a half inch wrench. In some cases you may be able to mount the carriage stop on the right hand side of the carriage instead of the left hand side and use it uh, more like I, what, the way I was using the indicators but I think you'll have to remove your uh, thread chasing dial in order to do that. So I've given you about three different ways of measuring your uh, x-axis. Well we put a uh, regular keyway into the shaft and now we'll put a woodruff keyway into the shaft. Now a woodruff key of course is a uh, you might know it better as a half moon key and the first thing we need to do is to select a key of the appropriate size for that shaft and it's a three-quarter shaft so I just decided that I'm going to make that a uh, 3 16 by 7 8 so that's 3 16 thick and it's 7 8 diameter if it was a full circle. We have to of course select the proper Woodruff Keys cutter size so there's different cutters for the uh, various key sizes and I've already selected a uh, 3 16 by 7 8 and I've got it mounted in the uh, lathe already. Woodruff key cutters can be used for other purposes too such as slots and uh, uh, <clears throat> various other operations you might use on the bridge port or on the Atlas lathe. The stock is now mounted in the vise and is perpendicular to the uh, spindle and we got the cutter mounted in the collet. Let's see if we can zoom up on that a little bit. Now there's several things that we have to do. Number one we have to decide whereabouts on the shaft that we're going to uh, cut the keyway and uh, I just arbitrarily uh, uh, selected uh, about three quarters of an inch in uh, on the center of the cutter. It doesn't really matter because this is a sample. But now we also have to move the cutter in to the center of the shaft the same as we set the other cutter to the center of the shaft only uh, in this direction. So that's just one slight difference that we have. We also have to uh, set the or determine the depth of the cut of the Woodruff key cutter and that is done by looking it up in uh, machinery handbook or some other handbook that would show the dimensions of Woodruff keys. Tubal Kane has a little confession to make. I had this indicator uh, originally set up against the cross slide here which uh, looked fine and all but when the cross slide was uh, moved in and out the indicator uh, tip was either interfering with these uh, gib lock screws or uh, whatever but it wasn't a good place to put the tip of the indicator so I made this little bracket here I had to take off the thread chasing dial it only took seven minutes to make that it's made out of aluminum but uh, that does not interfere with anything and we've got the 
uh, magnet right on the bed. Now I'll move that in a minute into the correct position. It's just set there for uh, demonstration purposes right now and you can see that it moves back and forth when I move the carriage. In some cases you may want to select an indicator that has a long range, you know, a full inch or more. This one has about a half inch range. You know, I've got three lights on this and we still got a dark spot. But the next step is to move the carriage in until it touches the cutter. Now I'm doing it without the spindle revolving, but uh, in some cases I have the cutter running when I do that. But this machine again has such sensitivity, I can feel it when I come up and touch it, which you might not feel on a bridge port. So at this point then I am zero, I've already zeroed out the indicator. Right on zero. And then the depth of this keyway, or not the depth rather, the uh, center of the shaft is uh, the same as it was on the other one. The work is 750, so half of that is 375. And the cutter thickness is 187, half of that's 93. We add the two together, 468. So I'm going to raise. Uh, or I should say lower the work so I don't damage the cutter and I'm going to move it in 468 thousandths and I'm looking at my indicator even though it's not on the uh, screen. Okay and now we're 468 thousandths in. I'm going to show you an alternate way of locating the carriage now the 468 thousandths that we just talked about. I'm showing you different ways because I know that some of you don't have uh, certain tools and uh, it's real easy to make uh, the adjustments here in the uh, Y and the Z directions but uh, because there's graduated collars but there is no graduations on the carriage. But another way to do that is to take an adjustable parallel and I've set the adjustable parallel for 468 You can also use gauge blocks or anything else that is uh, 468 thousandths and I've, I've locked the carriage lock and my cutter is still up against the work and bring your carriage in up against that then that can be removed and drop the work and then move the carriage up to the carriage lock, or carriage stop rather. Then we're ready to lock the spindle, or lock the carriage rather. The carriage is now locked and we're on the center of the work. As far as the x-axis is concerned. We're ready to cut. We're located in the center of the stock in this direction and as far as the Y direction I just arbitrarily went in uh, like I said before just a, a, a estimated distance. Stay as close to the vise as you can and make sure that you don't have any interference uh, between the cutter and the vise or uh, any other parts that could be damaged. Now the depth of our keyway is uh, 360 thousandths so I already zeroed out the collar on the Z axis that's the uh, hand wheel on the top and now we're ready to cut and this is a plunge cut we're going straight down so we're going to feed rather slowly and it's not going to all be on camera. Here we go. <laughs>
about down to depth. Make sure you got your glasses on and use a brush to remove the chip. Now we'll take it off and examine it. Here's the finished work. Boy, that was a sharp cutter because there was hardly any burr that was left. I did give it a couple strokes like that, but there was very little burr. Nice clean cut. I'm always afraid I'm going to break one of those cutters. I consider them to be kind of delicate because of the neck right here. That cutter apparently had never been used. Now there's the key and it fits in there very nicely. And that's how you cut a Woodruff key seat using the Atlas milling attachment. I guess I haven't discussed climb milling versus conventional milling. Study these pictures carefully. And in uh, this picture here, uh, notice the, this is conventional milling, notice the rotation of the cutter and that the work is being fed in this way. That's called conventional milling. Climb milling is when uh, the cutter is running the same direction but we're feeding the opposite direction. Climb milling will cause you, it may cause you, to break a cutter, uh, especially on lightweight machines or if the gibs are loose. What's going to happen as you're feeding, the milling cutter is going to try to climb up over the work and it'll jerk the backlash out of the table and at that point uh, stress itself and possibly break the cutter and damage the work as well. Climb milling often gives you a better finish on a Bridgeport mill when you're taking light cuts. Sometimes I climb mill as in my final pass because it gives you a real nice finish. But let's avoid climb milling at all costs with the milling attachment. Real quick review now on climb milling and conventional milling. The cutter is rotating this way and the work is being fed this way that is conventional milling. Now the cutter is going to be going the same direction and if we're feeding the other way, feeding in like this with our work, that's called climb milling because you can see that literally the cutter is climbing up the work and it wants to jerk it and at that point there will be damage. However, on massively built machines without any backlash, that is often a preferred method.